Well, Mike, it's my privilege to introduce Pastor Mike Mann as he comes and shares with us this morning. Mike, thank you so much for bringing God's word to us today. Psalm 139, wow, what a powerful psalm. And I just can't wait to sit under your teaching and hear what God has to say to us through you. All right. Is that thank enough you. pressure? Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> but All right. I, I told uh, uh, your wife earlier, too, that it also gives, it's a blessing to me knowing that it gives Mark a Saturday to just refresh. And it sounds like you made good use of your time you had yesterday, too. So, hey, it is a blessing to be able to share the Word of God. And what a great psalm, Psalm 139. Thank you, Mike and Sam. Just, uh, I was just resting in your reading. I just love to hear the Word of God read today. Yeah, that's an amen right there. Um, hey, we're starting a short little series, three parts to it, very Presbyterian, three, and, uh, and it's uh, called Faith for Life, and uh, today uh, we are looking at extraordinary life. In fact, one of the things I should point out to you before we get started, we did print out some little outlines. Some of you guys like them, some of you don't need them, but our ushers have them if you would like something to write on, and uh, you, you have that available to you. So, Extraordinary life, and I would, this is something that I was considering in terms of a title before I realized what weekend this was gonna happen on. And uh, we have just extraordinary things happening. You've got the Super Bowl, but it's also the same time, the Olympics. I don't know if you're following that at all, but I don't know if that's ever happened, that we've had the Super Bowl and the Olympics on the same weekend. And, you know, it used to be in January, the Super Bowl, it kept creeping and creeping. Now it's first week of February, second week of February, and, and I'm guessing at some point, Valentine's and the Super Bowl are gonna end up colliding, which is really gonna create some interesting scenarios, I think, at some homes. <laughs> Where are our priorities, unless you love it together? But, Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. There's all sorts of bowls going on there. So, um, but yeah, but this is a weekend where we're celebrating some of the most extraordinary talent, gifts, abilities that there are in, in, on earth. I mean, that's just phenomenal what some of these people are able to do and the skills they have. But what does it mean for us to live extraordinary in terms of Christians as people who the Bible uh, portrays. And, and so today we're going to explore a little bit about that. What does that mean? And how do we walk in terms of our faith? So let me say a word of prayer and then we're going to dive in. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you, Lord God, that um, for your word. We thank you for music. We thank you, Lord, for the beauty of creation. And we thank you, Lord God, that when we look to you, Lord, we look to the heavens. Lord, we just get a little sense of how great and awesome you are. I pray this morning, God, we would be refreshed in that as we hear from your word and what your plan is for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, one thing the Bible shouts out very clearly is that we definitely have an extraordinary God. In fact, that probably doesn't even come close to defining who our God is. Extraordinary, this idea of being beyond what is usual, beyond what is ordinary, regular, or established, something that's exceptional. And as we read that psalm earlier, I mean, how do you even touch on who God is? The very concept that God often is portrayed in the Bible is this word holy, which means that in its very root definition, to be set apart. That this God that we have is so distinct in his power, in his majesty, in his purity, in his wisdom, all these things, it's almost too hard for us to fathom and connect with. Here's a couple other psalms that speak to who the Bible says God is, just to give us a taste. Psalm 33, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Just by speaking it, the heavens came into existence. Their starry host, the Bible says, I don't know if any of you ever attempted to start counting stars at some point, but they estimate there's about 100 billion just in our galaxy, and then there's maybe perhaps estimates of a trillion galaxies. He spoke the stars into being. It says, by the breath of his mouth. It says, he gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. They're like nothing to him. Psalm 89, for who in the skies above can compare with the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? In the counsel of the holy ones, God is greatly feared. He is more awesome than all who surround him. And scripture goes on and on. These are just tastes 
of who God is. God is so far beyond us, anything that we think is extraordinary of ourselves would pale in comparison. The greatest thing we could think of on this earth, it doesn't even come close. And yet, the Bible says that this extraordinary God made some creatures. He had a hand in it. And we read this earlier in Psalm 139. It said that we are not, according to Scripture, not just some random cells that happen to have come together, but that God has been intimately involved in his creation. The psalm we read said, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together like we were carefully woven, like he understands he was a part of who we are and our intricacies. And when we see the human body, we see that it is so complex, so awesome, fearfully and wonderfully made, both with awesome reverence and marvelous distinction. But not only did God, according to scripture, knit us together, he also made humans so different from everything else. He didn't make us just like rocks or trees. The Bible said he made humans in his image. He doesn't say that to the rest of creation. He didn't say to that mountain, I made that in my image. He only says it of humans. There's something God-like that he has put in us, his creation, for some reason that he wanted to reflect. He's given us the capacity to reign over creation, the capacity to love one another, to build cities and communities to do good like he does. The Bible goes on to say that humans are basically what he has called the crown of his creation. In Psalm chapter eight, or uh, Psalm eight, it says, you have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor. So not only though, has he made humans this unique kind of exceptional part of his creation, he's also made distinctions within the humans themselves. He's given us different gifts, not just in how we look and appear, but in, in spiritual capacity. He's given us unique ways that we would work together with him to be part of what he has called us to do. So yes, we have an extraordinary God, the Bible tells us, who's made some extraordinary beings. So what? What does that mean? That's great, that's neat, let's take that in, we can go home and put that in our pocket, but what does it matter to us? Do we even need to worry about it? I mean, can we just be content in that thought and carry on? Can we just kind of live a normal life? Do we not have to be extraordinary? Normal sounds good. In fact, there's times in my life where I've kind of wanted to stand out, I want to make my mark in the world. I think when I was in high school and college, that was kind of, you gotta find your place, you know, and really shine for who you are, but then there's other times in my life where I'm actually pretty content to just be in the background. I really don't need to stand out right here in this moment. And maybe you're somewhere in that continuum. You're like, yeah, just being normal is fine. I don't need to, to be that way. And others, you're always kind of in the spotlight. What's wrong with just being content with being normal? Well, it depends on what our perspective of normal is. You see, the Bible says that the normal of this world is not really a, a good normal. It's not something to aspire to. The reason extraordinary becomes important is because there's a problem with the normal. The Apostle Paul wrote a letter to the church in Rome, and he basically said, you know, now that you're believers, you're followers in Christ, there's something you need to know. You can't keep conforming to the pattern of the world. And by that, he meant the attitudes, the lifestyles, the heart of the world. You see, something happened to God's good and awesome creation, and that is that sin broke into it. People turned against God. They were no longer grateful for what he has done. They decided they didn't need him and began going in their own way. And they also began to turn on each other in violence and other destructive ways, and they also turned on his creation itself, destroying the very planet and place that he had created. And so over time, through now hundreds and thousands of years, there has been destruction on this earth. His goodness has been corrupted. In fact, it speaks in uh, Paul in the same chapter in Romans, or in the same letter to the church in Rome. He said creation is crying out. Creation is crying out that something different would come, that it would be liberated from what the apostle Paul called bondage to decay. In other words, the normal of the world has become a bondage to decay from God's perspective. But here's the good news, there's another kind of normal. 
There's another kind of normal. It's God's normal that he intended for us all along. It's a normal of shalom, of peace. It's a normal of God's goodness. And God, in his infinite wisdom and love, found a way in his great purposes to bring us an opportunity to a, that new normal. Jesus, who God sent, his son, the Bible says, came to turn around what basically we had screwed up. Jesus came as God's merciful and gracious plan to turn around what was decaying and corrupt. There's a verse in uh, Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. He said, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone has received the forgiveness of Christ, that he came, he really was God's son, to die in our place, to take the judgment that was due us for all the stuff that had happened over history, including our own lives, that by receiving that grace and that love, we become part of setting in motion a new creation, a new normal. When we embrace Jesus, we begin to embrace the normal that God intended. In fact, the Bible says it's so radical, it's like we've been created all over again. Because to just live in the world's normal is actually not normal. It's actually abnormal. It's going against the normal that God had put in the first place. That's why the Bible will say that those who've come to receive the forgiveness, the, the new birth in Christ, become like, the Bible calls them, aliens. We become like aliens on this earth because we don't fit in that sense anymore, or strangers. And we become distinct in a good way. We become salt and light, not just because we want to stand out and be different, but because we become part of helping stop the decay and railing against that. So there's a purpose for us to be extraordinary, to not just kind of sit in the normal. But what does that mean? What does it mean to be extraordinary? What is, how do we put that together? How do we step into the extraordinariness that God has called us to? Well, we get one glimpse of that is, is through something we pray a lot, the Lord's Prayer. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we pray our Father who art in heaven Hallowed be your name. Again, that's that holy. Hallowed is that holy term. You are so set apart. You are so beyond us. God, and then it says, I pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is right now in heaven. In other words, God, I pray the normal of heaven where your goodness is abounding would come here. Would you come through me? Would you move into our earth because we can't do it here? You know, it's interesting in this uh, in these recent years, kind of how much um, super power, superhero movies have come out. I don't know if many of you have seen, they're all over the place, the Marvel comics. I mean, it's really a big deal. I don't recall that there were that many. I'd watch, you know, a few once in a while. But these superhero movies actually reflect kind of what God, in some ways, was saying here. Not, I wonder where the idea came from, right? If for, take, for example, Superman, which is one probably most of us would have a sense of, of, of that one, that character. Superman, where does his power come from? Did he just do a bunch of training? Did he get the right you know, video to follow and he just followed it really well and suddenly he was fast and powerful? Did he just do a lot of studies and get under the right tutors and become this exceptional, powerful being? Where does his power come from? It comes from somewhere else. The story is obviously he's from another planet, another place. And, and because of that, his power comes from outside of this earth. Jesus, when he was telling the disciples what they should prepare for, especially with the coming Holy Spirit, he said this. He said, remain in the city, remain in Jerusalem until you've been clothed with power from on high. You can't do it on your own. There's no amount of knowledge or training that's gonna get you to be who you need to stand and survive in this world. You need power from somewhere else. Well, what does that power look like? Does that mean that we get to be super fast? Do we have the power to like move a, to change the direction of a comet so it misses the earth? What kind of power do we have? I mean, the Bible does say that we can pray and mountains can move if we had enough faith. There are times where God has done some pretty wild and crazy supernatural things. But what does he mean? What is he calling us to do in terms of being extraordinary? Well, we get a pretty clear picture in the person of Jesus. Jesus emphasized some pretty awesome supernatural or powers. 
but they may not be what we first think of. One of the main characteristics of Jesus is echoed in a passage from the, a letter to Philippians. In chapter two of Philippians, it says this is what Jesus came to do in a very concise uh, few verses, and then he says, and you should follow in it. Let me read you uh, uh, one of the verses from that passage. Philippians two, verse eight, it says, and being found in appearance, in other words, Jesus being found in appearance as a man, as a human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. According to scripture, and according to Jesus, one of his superpowers was humility. In fact, he, he exercised a humility that we could never go to the extent that he did. Because if we believe what the Bible just said about how great God is, and the creator God he was, to go from that, that powerful, to one that would give himself even to being killed. This is the humility that Jesus demonstrated. Do we think of humility as a superpower? This is how Jesus came to win the world. Here's another superpower Jesus demonstrated. Serving. Probably haven't seen too many movies on the serving superpower. Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. In a case the disciples missed the point, which he demonstrated through his actions and spoke, he said, oh, and by the way, if you wanna be great, if you wanna be extraordinary, here's what you need to do. Be the servant of all. Be the servant of servants. That's your superpower if you really want greatness. He went on, he went on later to talk about faith. Over and over, he would remind the disciples, you need to have more faith, you have little faith. You can't do this without power from somewhere else. In fact, in one place, the, the disciples couldn't cast a demon out. They were into the supernatural power stuff. They were really into, I wanna see stuff happen kind of thing. You can imagine, we're like that too. And they couldn't get it out and they were so frustrated. Jesus says, it's because you have so little faith. It, it's not about the outcome, it's what's going on in your heart and your faith and where that power comes from. And then Jesus ultimately points, as does the Bible, to that ultimate superpower, the one that underlied not only what Jesus did, but what God has done, and that is what is love. We just spent several weeks talking about the power of love. God moves and changes things through his love, including our very creation. And there are other things too, but these are key things that Jesus brings to us, said this is the superpower that I have come to move in and through you. And these are just the normal of the kingdom of heaven. They feel abnormal here because our earth is so lost. It feels like these things are more strange. But in God's kingdom, this is the norm. Now, there are times when there really are supernatural things that God does that we think of. God equipped the disciples and Jesus demonstrated healings. And even today, we get to be a part of that. Praise God. At miracles, we get to speak words. Sometimes people will get insights, discernment, prophecies. There's all sorts of things that God does through word and deed that are like, wow. Thank God for that. So that happens too. But over and over, the Bible points to the priority. In fact, the Bible even warns against getting caught up too much in that focus. Because God doesn't say that you'll, they'll know you're my disciples by your miracles. God doesn't say they'll know you're my disciples by how many people you heal. He says they will know you're my disciples by the superpower of your love, by your serving, by your humility in Christ. Basically, what God's inviting us to be is more fully human. They say Jesus was, the, was divine, filled with God, but was also the most purely human. He, he was one, the Bible says, wept. He, he mourned. He felt sincerely. He was genuine. He wasn't just this kind of zombie powerful person. He was fully human in who he was. And the Bible also said he did stuff like went to weddings and Passover feasts. I wish we had a little more of a glimpse of just what it would have been like to be with Jesus at a party. But if what we believe about Jesus is true and he was fully human, man, he partied like no other that he had a joy that probably we're like, wow. And I believe that's what he's calling us to be, 
that we would be that fully human, that Christians would be known as those who are the most joyful. Man, those guys are crazy. When they get together and have a celebration, it's like nobody else. God's called us to be extraordinarily human as he's created us to be. So when? When should we be this? The extraordinary when is the next point. Well, you probably know the answer to that question. I will say this, in terms of my Christian faith, I'm really good at living my Christian faith in the future. I, I have great plans for how I'm gonna be with God tomorrow and future down the road. I'm also really good at looking backwards and saying, wow, that was a great moment. I remember that. That was so sweet when I was with Jesus. Where I get challenged, and maybe you do too, is now. Especially when I'm not in a nice loving environment in a room like this, but when I'm at the store, when I'm frustrated because things haven't gone my way, when things, it's just a bad day. Not so much. And yet, that is what Jesus has called us to be, to be in the now. In fact, one of the great examples we have from scripture of this is David. King David in the Old Testament. David, who as a kid, comes on the scene in a powerful way. In fact, that story with him and, and Goliath is, is so interesting. And many of you have, obviously, it's the Sunday school story, but you've got two armies that are going up against each other. The army of the Lord, Israel, who is representing God really to the world at that point, and the Philistines. And they're at a stalemate because there's this big guy who is just like so ominous, Goliath, that, that no one knows what to do with him. And he's taunting Israel, and he's saying, your God is worthless, and come, who will defy me? And week after week, the Israelites say, yeah, I'm not so sure about this. I don't know if God's really here in this moment. You know, I was thinking about this the other day. Can you imagine if they say you may have been like nine feet tall? Can you imagine if Goliath was in the Olympics? I mean, what a javelin throw. <laughs> you would have to redo the stadium. And then I thought, what if he was a football player? Can you imagine? I mean, this, would, this is your offensive lineman, right? This is like who in the world would get by him? Just, they just look at him and they'd go. Or I think if I were on a team, it, he'd be a great tight end. I mean, it would just be every play. Just go, okay, G this, G that, G this. Every time you heard G, the, the other group would just give up. But anyway, yeah, this guy was an amazing character and he was scary to them. And yet, why? Why were they so hesitant? It wasn't like Israel didn't know their God at this point. It wasn't like in the time of Abraham where they were just starting to figure out this God. It wasn't like when they were slaves in Egypt, they hadn't become a nation yet and they hadn't seen his miracles. It wasn't like when they were in the wilderness still trying to figure things out. No, they had been through all this. They had become a nation, seeing God's miracles, his power, his love over and over, and yet they say, I don't know if he's gonna show up on this time. And in walks David. They said that this went on for 40 days. And young David, who was too young to even be in the army, shows up, probably a teenager, and really asks the question, how do we know that God doesn't want to move right now? Why do we just keep putting off, waiting, thinking maybe, he, maybe this will go away and I won't have to worry about it? Why do we not step forward in the faith of the God that we have? I think the problem is we struggle with whether God will really move. We struggle with whether we think he will really come through, whether he will really show up. One of the reasons this uh, passage and this theme has been on my heart is that um, I often think that we live our life in Christ in little pockets. Um, one pocket is, it's a great pocket, is right here, Sunday mornings. Uh, yeah, we're connected with Jesus. We're thinking about God. We're, our, our thoughts are in a good place. Maybe when you uh, meet with a, a, your small group, your growth group, another time where it's just God is kind of, you feel the presence, you're in the moment, or when you pray or when you read the word. But when I think of my week, even as a pastor, that's not what I'm doing a lot of my day. I'm doing a lot of other stuff, and I think sometimes a thought comes in that, God, you're probably not here as much. You were there and you were there. But all these other things, when I'm running errands, when I'm having a frustrating experience, when I'm facing difficulty, when I'm sick, whatever these things, I'm not sure you're so present now, God. And yet David says, no. 
He says, his spirit is everywhere I go. We read this earlier. Where can I go from your spirit, David said? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, in other words, the very beginning of the morning, you're there. If I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness won't be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. God, there's no moment, there's nothing, no matter how bad nor how difficult the situation where you are not present, God. I've been uh, in my uh, own personal devotions. Uh, I read through different areas of scripture, and I'm in the Christmas story right now. I know I'm a little late, but, um, but that's just where I'm at. And, and one, of the, uh, one of the emphasis that, that has really stood out to me recently is just before Jesus was born is the biblical writer emphasizing faithfulness in God. And particularly through the uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth, who were the parents, became the parents of John the Baptist. Now, many of us know the story. There's that famous story where Zechariah is a priest. He goes into the, the temple to do these things. He gets meet, met by the angel Gabriel. And, and we kind of know Zechariah for screwing up a little bit because instead of believing him, he didn't believe the angel and he's made to be mute. And, and so we kind of hold on to that story. But there's a verse that happens before that that talks about how actually Zechariah and Elizabeth were stellar in their faith. Listen to what uh, the Gospel of Luke writes about them. He says, both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blameless. They weren't just righteous in their own eyes, they were righteous in God's eyes. That's huge. And then he goes on to say, and they were blameless. Who are these people? I mean, we read about the Pharisees and others. This is amazing. And the Bible says they were very old. So they had a long life. But what they didn't have was a child. Now, here he is a priest, which is a great position in society. People looked up to him. But to not have a child in that society, as well as other cultures, was tremendous shame. Because people would have looked and doubted and wondered, I wonder if maybe they didn't do everything so right after all. Wonder what he's hiding. And they must have known that decade after decade, and just wanting to have a child. And then one day, he's there worshiping, doing his service in the temple, and bam, there's an angel of the Lord. Zechariah, God's seen your faithfulness. You're gonna have a child, and not just any child, Zechariah. You're gonna have the forerunner of the Messiah. You're gonna bear the one that the Bible has said would be the coming Elijah. You're gonna be the one, your child is gonna be the one that Jesus said there would be none greater in all of history than your son. We remember Zechariah's first tripping up, but I just see so much. I love this story of God saying, God sees your faithfulness, Zechariah. Way to go. Way to hang in there. And I think of us, how many times we walk faithfully with the Lord or seek, and we don't see things show up the way we think they should. God sees that, and there will be times where he'll show you, watch, watch, wait, don't give up. But here's the thing, we live in the age of the Holy Spirit, and I believe God wants to move many more times than we give him credit to. That he's not going to have us wait decade after decade, that he wants to move in our situations in the now. Perhaps there's someone today that God is wanting you to be an offer of his grace. Finally, I want to come to how do we walk in this extraordinariness that God calls us to? If it's now, how do we do that? Where do we find the capacity to do this? And I want to uh, look at a verse to close this morning. It's another one of David's Psalms. Psalm 143, verse 8, and we'll put it up here. And um, this is something that I've recently made, um, actually a prayer. Uh, It's David's prayer, so I figure if he can pray it, why can't I? Uh, But here it is. Let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love, for in you I trust. Make me know the way I should go, go, for to you I lift up my soul. 
I love this. It, it, it has two emphases. The first one is simply this. David is saying, my power, my extraordinariness is nothing I can work up. It comes from you, God. It comes from who you are. And so it acknowledges the character of God. It begins by saying, God, I look to your extraordinariness, your holiness, your justice, your mercy, your goodness, your power. But most of all, Lord, let me not miss your love. Let me not forget your love. The first step when we receive Christ and his forgiveness, when we acknowledge that we need his mercy and that his act that he did, his death and resurrection was for us, is basically saying to God, I receive your love. I believe it. I believe you love me that much and that's why he came, I received that. And the great apostle Paul wrote about what motivated him. You know, apostle Paul wrote more of the New Testament than anyone else. He is that one after Christ we look to. Is just going, wow, what an amazing man of God. But he, he said, here's what motivated me. He didn't say it was, I'm motivated because I just needed to do it. He didn't say I was motivated because I should do it. He said, I'm motivated because Christ's love compels me. He was driven by the love of Christ. What's compelling you? What compels your walk with the Lord? Is it what you think you need to do, what you should do, or is the love of God underneath that? And if it's not the love of God, go back. It's not worth it. <laughs> walk in the love of God. There's a couple reasons, I believe, and there's, that people miss God's love. And I think this is just so key, which David recognized even in his time. One is they just don't believe it. They just don't believe that God really is there or loves them. If that's your place today, I would invite you to do this. Get a Bible, whether it's digital or, or physical, whatever works for you. Go to the New Testament, because that's kind of that jumps to the part of Jesus, but anywhere is good. And ask this question as you read God's word. Why are you here? Why am I here? Because I believe you will hear if you're sincere in reading and asking God to speak to you, that he will say it's because you're God. There is a God who wants to know you. He wants to be in relationship with you and he wants for you to know him. I just, it, it is, if you trust God with that, the Holy Spirit, I believe, will show your heart that his love is that real. Now the other reason I think we miss God's love is maybe we do believe it in a sense, we have a knowledge about it, but we don't enjoy it. We don't enjoy it. It's like it's kind of this thing that's in our head, but we don't really experience or just allow it to wash over us. Maybe we're too busy. Maybe we're doubtful or fearful. I would encourage us all to just ask God if that is it. God, remove anything that would be a hindrance to me knowing your love. We were designed to walk in his love. Other than that, we end up in darker paths. What I want to do this morning is conclude by praying that scripture out for all of us. I just want to pray that we would, even this morning, just have a fresh glimpse of God's love. That is the starting point. It is the foundation for living in the normal, the extraordinary that we may hope to be. So I'm going to uh, pray it out, the two parts. One is that we would uh, receive and experience God's love, and the second, that out of that love, we would know his calling, his leading, even if it's just for the moment. So I invite you, would you pray with me? First of all, God, we just, um, we thank you for who you are. God, I thank you that you are just so amazing. You are trustworthy. You are faithful. You are merciful. You are just, you are good, Lord God, and we just affirm that today. And Lord, we also want to be honest with you, Father, about our own failings. Lord, we confess there's times that we have been too caught up, Lord, in wanting to follow the patterns of this world. Lord, forgive us for times that we've actually contributed to the destruction and decay of what is happening around us. Lord, we want to live differently. Oh, Lord God, I thank you that you love us so much. Lord, I pray right now in this room, Father, that you would give each heart and those online, if you're watching in your room somewhere or in your car, wherever you are, Lord, I pray for a fresh glimpse of your love right now. Lord, may we have a glimpse of the one who came to wash our feet, the one who, the Bible says, delights and takes pleasure in what he's created. 
Lord, I thank you that you love us no less than when you first created us. When you first had us in your mind, Lord, you love us that way, and if not even more so now. Lord, help us just to enjoy just that precious gift, Father. Seeing your face looking into our face, your gracious hand upon us, your Holy Spirit, your goodness. God, refresh us in your love. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, I pray out of that love that we would hear your leading. Lord, I pray that, God, you would show some of us today who you may want to heal. God, I pray we'd be a vessel of your healing. Who in our lives, Lord, is it that, God, you want us to pray or visit or come beside and be a source of, of a miraculous healing? Lord, I pray that we could be a word of encouragement. Maybe even before we leave this place today, that you would lead us to someone that we could be a, a just an incredible source of filling thirst with encouragement and hope. Lord, it says in your word that when we follow you, we will shine among the people on this earth like stars. Lord, you created all these stars, and yet, Lord, you created us to shine like them. Lord, instead of being little pockets with you, I pray an ongoing stream in our lives of hearing and being extraordinary with you. Thank you, Lord, that you are our power, our hope. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.